Cards which require you to discard your entire hand are incredibly rare, and usually tied to incredibly powerful effects, or the complete opposite. In this video, we're going to look at some of these less than stellar effects that require you to discard your entire hand in order to use them, or are just part of their effects in some way. And at number 10, we have Infernity Sage. This is a level 2 tuner monster which has the effect, where during your main phase you can discard your entire hand. And that's the entire effect. You don't gain anything for discarding your hand, you're just allowed to discard your entire hand. And funny thing about this card is that it's actually kind of decent in Infernity decks because of its floating effect, where if this card is sent to the graveyard in any way, you can send an Infernity monster from your deck to the graveyard, as long as you had no other cards in your hand when the effect trigger was met. Now, the reason why this card is actually decent for Infernity decks is because they like having tutor monsters that go into their synchro plays, and they like ways of getting Infernity Archfiend or Infernity Necromancer to the graveyard. And both Necromancer and Archfiend require you to have no cards in your hand in order to use their effects. As Infernity Archfiend has the effect, that if it's special summon while you have no cards in your hand, you can add any Infernity card from your deck to your hand. And this effect is not once per turn, so normal Infernity combos revolve around bringing out Infernity Archfiend as many times per turn as possible. And since it's a level 4 Dark Monster, it combos perfectly well with the level 2 Infernity Sage to go into Coral Dragon so you can synchro climb into higher level monsters like Barone. And one problem Infernity decks actually have is getting rid of every card in their hand sometimes. So the ability to send all the cards in your hand to the graveyard could actually be beneficial, even if you gain no benefits from doing so which is why this card is only number 10 on this list. Technically, the effect is not very good because you don't gain anything for discarding your hand, but the incredible circumstances revolving around the card and its archetype make it an option that might actually be worth considering, even if it's mostly used for its tuner status and level and floating effect, and not for its ability to discard your entire hand for no effect. And at number 9, we have Spell Chronicle. This is the continuous spell card which has the effect where you can send your entire hand to the graveyard to activate it in order to banish any 5 spell traps from your deck. Then it has the effect where each time your opponent activates a spell card, you place one Chronicle counter on this card. And you can remove two Chronicle counters from this card to have your opponent choose one of the cards you banished and add it to your hand. And also, if this card leaves the field, you take 500 points of damage for every card that is still banished by its effect. So, the intended way to use this card was to punish your opponent for activating too many spells by allowing you to get a whole bunch of your cards back with its effect. And since you can potentially go plus four off this card's effects, it required you to discard your entire hand was supposed to kinda balance out the potential card advantage, even though you can just use the card when you only have one card in your hand for a minimum discard. However, you only get to add back one card per two spell cards your opponent activates. So unless your opponent is playing some kind of very spell heavy deck, you're not going to be able to use the effect very often. In fact, the card never really saw any competitive play because it just wasn't feasible, especially for the cost of having to discard your entire hand. However, there is actually a way to get all the cards you banished for its effect back to your hand almost immediately. In the Witchcrafter archetype, there exists a card called Witchcrafter Patronus. Patronus has the graveyard effect that you can banish this card from your graveyard, except the turn it was sent there, in order to add back any number of your banished Witchcrafter spells with different names to your hand. So, if you simply use Spell Chronicle to banish five different named Witchcrafter spell cards, then you can simply use Patronus to get them all back immediately. And if you just simply activate Spell Chronicle when you had one card left in your hand, that's a huge plus in card advantage. And because of this interaction, there was actually a little bit of controversy where pro players were hyping up Spell Chronicle as a very valuable card, which manipulated the secondary market into making Chronicle cost a lot of money. However, Spell Chronicle never saw any competitive play. Because, funnily enough, the competitive versions of Witchcrafter decks didn't even play Witchcrafter Patronus. If they did play any trap cards, they would usually just use Metaverse so they could search out Secret Village and Spellcasters to lock your opponent down, or just Rivalry of the Warlords for a different Floodgate. They just didn't really care about using Spell Chronicle or Patronus to get cards back, because they can instead just use cards like Monster Gator Reasoning to get a whole bunch of the Witchcrafter spells into the graveyard, because they all have a hard once per turn effect that adds them back to your hand from the graveyard if you didn't use their hand effects that turn. So, take Witchcrafter Creation for example. This card allows you to add a Witchcrafter monster from your deck to your hand. But if this card is in your graveyard and you control Witchcrafter monster and you hadn't used its first effect, you can add it back to your hand during the end phase with a shared hard once per turn between both of these effects. And since all of the Witchcrafter spells work this way, you can get them all back to your hand very easily by just milling them to the graveyard. No need to do the Spell Chronicle Witchcrafter Patronus combo. And at number 8, we have Rope of Life. This is a trap card that can only be activated when a monster is destroyed by battle and sent to the graveyard, where you discard your entire hand in order to special summon that monster back to your side of the field, and also grant it a permanent 800 attack boost. So, if you only have one card in your hand, you basically discard one card in order to bring back one monster. Now, technically, this is a good effect, because being able to special summon monsters from your graveyard has always historically been pretty good. And 800 attack boost is a pretty decent upside on top of it. However, the problem with the card is that it only brings back a monster which was destroyed by battle specifically. 
and of course requires you to discard your entire hand, which is a super steep cost. This card was released in the time when cards like Hall of the Haunted were banned or limited to one copy for being too good at bringing back cards in the graveyard. So the value on special summoning unconditionally from the graveyard was thought to be incredibly valuable. So of course it needed to have all kinds of restrictions on it, but the restrictions were just too much, and Rope of Life never actually saw any competitive play. If it didn't require you to discard your entire hand, it might have, but that restriction was just too much of a detriment, where it was already conditional on only working on monsters that were destroyed by battle. Because one of the reasons Call the Haunted was so good was because you could send a card from your deck to the graveyard with something like Foolish Burial and then just bring it out, which Rope of Life could never do because you can only bring back monsters that you already summoned onto the field properly in the first place. And at number 7, we have Single Purchase. This is a spell card which has the effect where you can add any monster from your deck to your hand. However, in order to do so, you need to have at least three other cards in your hand, none of which are monsters, and then you have to banish all those cards face up in order to add that monster from your deck to your hand. Then you have another restriction where you can't summon a monster for the rest of the turn except for the monster with that name. So basically, it's a minus three in card advantage to search one card from your deck if you go for the absolute minimum number of cards required to use it. And honestly, if it wasn't for the second part of that restriction, the card might have actually seen more competitive play. Because being able to search out unconditionally any monster from your deck is incredibly valuable for all kinds of different strategies. For example, if you search out a Cyberstein, you can just use it to go into a plethora of fusion monsters to stop your opponent from having a chance to win the game. However, because of its second restriction, where you can only summon monsters of its name that turn, you wouldn't be able to summon out a card like Nature Exterior or Last Warrior from another planet. Additionally, because it requires you to banish your entire hand, you'd be hard-pressed to use it with something like Royal Magical Library, a card that is very commonly used in FDK strategies in order to draw every card from your deck, since it has a non-once-per-turn effect where it places a spell counter itself every time a spell card is activated, where you can remove these three spell counters to draw a card. The card allows you to create an advantage machine, where there is a whole bunch of draw one cards like Into the Void in order to get free spell counters on Royal Magical Library in order to eventually draw every card in your deck. However, you need to activate at least three spell cards before you're able to draw a single time for Royal Magical Library, and the amount of card advantage you lose for searching it out through a single purchase means it would be incredibly difficult to get the engine online if it was your intended search target. So basically, both of its restrictions kind of make the card unplayable. If you want to bring out a super powerful singular monster from your deck, like Cyberstein, you can't really use its effect. If you want to use a super powerful FTK enabler like Royal Magical Library, losing your entire hand means it'd be very hard to use its effect as well. However, if you're playing an archetype where all the monsters change their name to a single monster, like Cyber Dragons, for example, then it could be a way to search cards from that archetype and not really have to worry too much about its restrictions. Except you still be losing a bunch of cards in your hand, and none of the Cyber Dragon monsters are really worth a minus three card advantage to search them from your deck, nor are any of the Harpy monsters who share a similar distinction of name changing. And at number six, we have Berserker Soul. This is a quick play spell card which has the effect where if a monster you control is able to inflict 1500 or less points of battle damage to your opponent by a direct attack specifically, then you can discard your entire hand in order to activate this card's effect, where you reveal the top card of your deck up to 8 times, in order to inflict 500 damage to your opponent if what you revealed was a monster. However, if at any point while you're revealing cards you reveal a non-monster card, then the chain ends and the effect ends immediately. So if you're lucky and go into a whole bunch of monsters, you can inflict 4000 points of damage to your opponent with one card which is absolutely worth a discard of your entire hand, with a minimum of only one. Because with the starting life point value of 8,000, and only having 5 cards in your starting hand, every single card has to deal at least 1,600 points in damage for it to be worthwhile burn card that can win you the game with your 5 starting card opening hand. And Berserker Soul's 4,000 points of damage definitely clears that 1,600 threshold. However, burn decks generally don't play a lot of monster cards, and generally decks that play a whole bunch of low attack monsters that can attack directly like Watts play a lot of spell cards in order to supplement their low attack point values and can't end games very quickly anyway. So in both these kinds of decks that Berserker Soul might be useful in, it can't really be used effectively in either of them. In order to guarantee that you're going to inflict 4000 points of damage, you have to somehow guarantee the top 8 cards of your decks are monsters, which you can only really do by playing a full on monster mash deck and only one copy of Berserker Soul, so there's no chance to reveal the other copies, which is just incredibly inconsistent for pulling the card off. And in burn decks, the strategy that Berserker Soul is asking you to employ is just not really feasible for these kinds of decks. So while technically the effect of inflicting up to 4,000 burn damage to your opponent is very worth the cost, there just isn't really a deck that can properly accommodate this like Infernity Sage has. And at number 5, we have Ally of Justice Decisive Armor. This is a level 10 synchro monster which requires one tuner plus two or more non-tuners as its materials. And right off the bat, any monster that requires two or more non-tuner materials better have an absolutely banger effect because that's very hard to accomplish. Because for even less effort, 
you can go to something like Barone, which only requires one non-tuner material, has the same level, and also generic materials. So, what does Decisive Armor do? Well, once per turn, if your opponent controls a light monster, you can choose one of its three effects to activate, where you can destroy one set card your opponent controls, or send a card from your hand to the graveyard to destroy all spell and trap cards your opponent controls, or you can choose to send your entire hand to the graveyard to look at your opponent's hand. Then if your opponent has any light monsters in their hand, you send them all to the graveyard and inflict damage upon equal to the attack of all those monsters. Now, Ally of Justice Decisive Armor belongs in the Ally of Justice archetype, which is an archetype dedicated to having anti-light monster support for lore reasons, which made them a mess of an archetype to play in actual Yu-Gi-Oh! The Ally of Justice are kind of infamous for being one of the worst archetypes ever created because they center around only countering light attribute monsters. Because if your opponent is not playing any light monsters, most of their effects don't do anything, so you'd be reliant on cards like DNA Transplant in order to make your opponent's light attribute so your effects can actually be live. And DNA Transplant is not a searchable card in the traditional sense, and they don't really have a good in-archetype way of changing your opponent's attributes either. However, Ally of Justice Decisive Armor does have an FTK associated with its hand discard effect. All you have to do is get two light monsters with 4,000 attack in your hand, then use Gold Moon Coin to give them to your opponent's hand. Then bring out Ally of Justice Decisive Armor, then get a light monster on your opponent's side of the field, and if you're able to accomplish all this, you can burn your opponent for 8,000 points of damage and win on your first turn. However, anyone who's ever played Yu-Gi-Oh! should know how incredibly difficult accomplishing all of this in one turn is. And if you're not trying to go for this FDK, then Ally of Justice Decisive Armor is just kind of a bad boss monster, where there's no reason to go into it over the other plethora of generic level 10 synchro monsters. Except maybe back in the day when this card first came out, when there wasn't really other options available, where it just being a 3300 attack beat stick was actually its main selling point. And at number 4, we have Gambler of Legend. This is a level 4 monster with the effect where you can toss a coin 3 times. Then you apply one of its effects based on the amount of heads you get, where if you get 3 heads you get to destroy all of your opponent's monsters. Only 2 heads you get to discard one random card from your opponent's hand. If you only get 1 head, you have to destroy 1 card you control. And if you get 0 heads and only tails, you have to discard your entire hand. Now, the Gambler of Legends is in a long line of gamble-only cards, which were made to have incredible upsides if you managed to get the coin tosses correctly, but have incredibly negative downsides if you didn't. And pretty much all of the gamble cards that exist are pretty bad, and this one isn't really an exception. However, it is an upgraded version over Sand Gambler, which has a similar effect but only two results based on getting all heads or all tails, where at least Gambler of Legend has a chance to have two positive effects based on getting lots of heads and discarding your entire hand is only an incredibly negative effect that happens rarely. However, it's still not very good nonetheless, because the upsides are just not that good, and the downsides are pretty detrimental if they do happen to you, especially since the card takes up the resource of your normal summon in order to be brought out, It only has a paltry 500 attack, and can't really help push for game if you do destroy your opponent's monsters. Where at least Decisive Armor could be used as a beat stick back in the early days, Gambler of Legend was just a gimmicky card created for people who wanted to play gimmicky decks, and was never meant to be competitive. And at number 3, we have Dicelops. This is a level 4 monster with 1800 attack, which has an effect where you can roll a 6-sided die. Then you apply one of its 3 effects based on the result, where if you roll a 1, you look at your opponent's hand and then discard any one card from their hand. If you roll a 2 to 5, you have to discard one card from your hand. And if you roll a 6, you have to discard your entire hand. Now, the most beneficial thing about Dicelops is the fact that it's an 1800 attack fire monster with 200 defense, which means it's technically a target for rekindling, and if it's brought out with rekindling from the graveyard, it has a pretty decent attack stat that you can use to help beat for a game. However, the actual effect of the card itself only has a 1 in 6 chance of a positive result, as the other 5 in 6 chances are all wholly negative, especially having to discard your entire hand. In fact, it's to the point where it's probably one of the worst gambling cards in the game because the chance of a positive effect is just way too low, and it's incredibly difficult to influence the outcome for a positive result. At least with Gambler of Legend, you have cards like Second Coin Toss, which allow you to try tossing coins again if you want, or Proton Blast, which can guarantee all three results are heads by banishing itself from the graveyard. With Dice Lops, your best piece of support is a trap card called Nat 6, which has the effect of allowing you to change a dice result to a 1 or a 6 depending on if it rolled one of the other three numbers where if you roll a 2, 4, or 6, you can change the result to a 1 instead, which means it gives you 3 additional chances to roll a 1, putting it up to a 66% chance of getting the positive result, and completely eliminating the negative result that is on your entire hand, since it's able to convert a 6 roll into a 1. However, that 6 is not a very useful card for dice rolling card effects, because a lot of them have negative effects on a roll of a 1 or a 6, but technically it does work with dice slops, if you really want to try to get a positive result with the effect to work, as technically the positive effect is actually good, just not worth the normal 5 and 6 chance of getting an incredibly negative effect. And at number 2, we have Full Salvo. 
This is a trap card which has a very simple effect, where you discard your entire hand in order to inflict 200 damage to your opponent for each card sent to the graveyard by its effect. So, if you discard 5 cards from your hand, you get to inflict 1000 points of damage to your opponent. Basically, allowing you to convert every card in their hand into a Sparks. Now, the actual ratio of cards to effect damage is terrible with this card. As I mentioned earlier, you need at least 1600 points of damage for a singular card to be worth being a burn card. And most burn cards are not worth that. And Konami specifically does not design cards that can burn for more than 1600 points of damage without a whole bunch of restrictions or conditions. And the funny thing about Full Salvo is if you only discard one card from your hand, it's basically a worse Sparks because you're going minus 2 in card advantage to only inflict 200 points of damage to your opponent, since Full Salvo does not count itself when dealing damage, only the cards in your hand that you're discarding for the effect. So if anything, this card might actually be worse than one of the worst cards in the game, which is a wonder why we have any cards above it on this list. Although, you'll see why it's not number 1 on this list once we get to that spot. And finally, at number 1, we have Rocket Arrow Express. This is a level 10 monster with 5,000 attack, which is the highest attack a monster can have on a base card, and it has the effect where... It can only be special summoned from your hand while you control no cards, and cannot be special summoned in other ways. When this card is special summoned, you can't enter your battle phase that turn, you also can't activate any cards or effects, or set any cards while this is on the field, and during each of your standby phases you have to send your entire hand to the graveyard or destroy this card. So, let me spell out why this card is bad. Basically, what it does is give you a 5000 attack beat stick with no protection, that floodgates you from using your card effects, can't attack the turn it's brought out by giving you a summoning sickness out of your entire battle phase, then has a maintenance cost to keep it on the field by getting rid of your entire hand. And since you can't activate any cards or effects, you can't use anything to protect the card. And since it requires a clear field in order to summon, you can't have any floodgates out that would allow the card's big attack stack to shine and beat over other normal summoned monsters. Which was a strategy that Malefic Cyber and Dragon would do back in the day with Necro Valley decks. And then, on top of all those restrictions, it can't even attack the turn it's brought out which is its main selling point. Then you have to get rid of your entire hand during your standby phase in order to keep it out. The only possible use of this card is just to normal summon a monster immediately after you bring it out, then use it to go into some kind of extra deck play. Although the kinds of beneficial extra deck plays you can accomplish when you're not allowed to activate card effects are so incredibly limited that this card is just not really useful even in that scenario, because a lot of cards that could bring themselves out from your hand without using a card effect kind of require you to have a clear field too. So it's not very useful as a beat stick because you can't play with floodgates, and it's not very useful as an XC's climbing tool because you can't use effects to bring out other monsters, so it's just kind of a useless card all around. And to quite possibly one of the worst cards in the game, that has a maintenance cost on top of all its other nugget effects that requires you to send your entire hand to the graveyard, which was really not necessary because the card was already awful before you even account for its maintenance cost. Alright, and that's the list. Do you know of any other terrible cards that require you to discard your entire hand that we may have missed, or have any ideas for similar videos just like this one? If so, we'd love to hear about them down in the comments.